Hello everyone. In this video, we will be learning about principles of planning. We will learn about aspect, prospect, privacy, grouping, and ruminous. So the first principle is aspect. Aspect is connected to the placement of different rooms of the house in accordance with their activities at different hours of the day. The rooms should get enough sunlight and air. Apart from creating a cheerful atmosphere, it is also good from the hygiene point of view. Windows are provided to fulfill these requirements. Windows should be provided on at least one side of the room and if possible on two or even three sides. This should be of the same height as far as possible but their widths can vary. The kitchen should have an eastern or northeast aspect and the bedrooms a southwest or northwest aspect. The study room and storeroom should have a northern aspect and the living area should have southeastern or northeastern aspect. The next principle is prospect. Prospect refers to the view as seen off the outside from the windows in general and doors in external walls. It is determined by the view as desired from certain rooms of the house. For example, view of the garden or a nearby hill. At the same time, it is naturally intended to conceal some undesirable views. It will be observed that sometimes aspect and prospect considerations may be at variance with each other and herein lies the skill and imagination of the architect. Window locations are useful to keep visual control on the plot, that is, the main entrance gate or the backside. It is a protection against intruders. Here are some examples of projected windows for better prospect. The next principle is privacy. Privacy is of two types. The first one is privacy of the whole building with reference to the surrounding buildings and roads. This can be achieved by screening the entrances both front and back, planting of trees and creepers. The second one is privacy in different rooms that is bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, etc. This is achieved by correct positioning of the doors and openings of the shutters. The shutters should open in such a way that a person entering the room will get minimum view. A large portion of the details of the room, such as beds in a bedroom, should not be visible at a glance. For maximum privacy, single shutters are better than double shutters. Provision of frosted glass for windows provide more privacy than plain glass. Here, as you can see, providing a door at the center of the wall gives less privacy than providing a door at the corner of the wall. The next principle is grouping. Grouping implies an arrangement of various rooms in reference to their functions. As most people like to sit in the veranda, the living room should naturally be next to it. The kitchen and dining room must be close to each other. Sanitary arrangements must be adjacent to the bedrooms. There should be independent access to sanitary units. The staircase must be approachable from the maximum number of rooms. The passage area must be minimum, well ventilated and sufficiently well lit. This should be designed taking into consideration 
the movement of persons from one unit to another without causing disturbance to the other units. The shape of a building is determined by a shape of the plot. It is also dependent upon the grouping of various individual units. The area of the plot, the permissible built-up area, the area proposed to be built, area for future expansion, etc. are the points which are considered while judging the efficiency of the plan. The next principle is roominess. After establishing the area for a particular unit, the next job is to check and if required modify the dimensions such as length, width and height of a unit with reference to the consideration of roominess. In planning a building, an architect deals with length, width and height. In short, he deals with space. The height of man is the real measure, his eye level, the height up to which he can raise his hands, the length of his bed, etc. are some measures by which we can compare different levels such as the window sill level, top level of doors and windows. The feeling of space that is whether it is sufficient, less or more or cramped depends upon suitable and adequate proportions of the minimum dimensions required for the functions expected to be achieved. If the length of the room exceeds one and a half times its width, the result will be a cramped effect. A square room is found to be inconvenient as compared to a rectangular room of the same area. Hence, the length to width ratio should be between 1.2 is to 1 and 1.5 is to 1. Less width with more length will cause a tunnel effect. Positions of doors, windows, cupboards, lofts and their level and the color treatment of the flooring, walls, ceilings are all responsible for creating the effect of space. Light colors create the effect of more space whereas dark colors make the room smaller. Hence a combination of light and dark colors for different walls of the same room will apparently reduce the effect of less width and more length. The imagination of the architect leads him to project the look of a particular room or area with reference to the furniture pieces and their location, sizes of doors and windows, areas interrupted and uninterrupted by openings and the effect to be achieved while deciding the color scheme of the walls. I hope you understood the points explained in this video. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone, in the last video we learned about principles of planning and we have covered aspect, prospect, privacy, grouping and roominess. In this video we will learn about sanitation, flexibility, furniture requirements, lighting and cleanliness. The first principle is sanitation. Sanitary facilities such as water closets and bathrooms should be provided with dados so that they can be cleaned regularly. The flooring and side walls should be finished with waterproofing material before fixing the tiles for the floor. A water carriage system is good for cleaning. If this system is not possible, properly designed septic tanks should be used. 
provision of an overhead reservoir storage at ground level with the rate at 135 liters per head per day or maximum available rate and pumping arrangement will provide continuous water supply to the units provision of water supply drainage rainwater and ventilation pipes and their connection to the wall and various units require careful thought to avoid leakage on walls a plan showing gully traps inspection chambers manholes gradient to pipes flow direction etc should be prepared the next principle is flexibility the requirements of a family change as the family expands the kitchen and the dining space have to be combined in most houses there may not be any separate guest room and it may become necessary to convert the living room into a guest room when required three or four roomed houses should be designed with special regard to this flexibility furniture like sofa cum beds easily help in achieving this the most important requirement in planning is to provide independent access to sanitary units from all rooms in short flexibility is the ability of a building to continuously adapt its space layout and even its structure to evolving needs the next principle is furniture requirements the success of a functional planning can be judged immediately by observing the plan which details furniture arrangement of sofas chairs tables carpets television and other decorative pieces in the living room chairs and dining table in the dining room cupboards and refrigerators in the kitchen and beds easy chairs and dressing tables in the bedroom the furniture should be arranged to give maximum area for movement and convenience regarding opening of doors and cupboards and opening and closing of window shutters the position of beds should give privacy with reference to the direction of opening of shutters for the door sufficient light for reading and for getting cool breeze during the night the whole set of arrangement must be comfortable built up furniture units are provided in bedrooms by providing a loft about the projecting walls the next principle is cleanliness the design of the room should be such that dust should not accumulate in any part of the room dust is injurious to health it allows the growth of bacteria and spread of diseases moldings skirtings and corners are the places of dust accumulation the design of the room should be such that it can be cleaned easily the next principle is lighting it is important from the point of view of illumination and hygiene lighting is of two types natural lighting and artificial lighting in some cases both natural and artificial lighting may be required to give sufficient light the source of natural lighting is the sun sun is a source of illumination and it also destroys certain germs the intensity of natural light is affected by pollutants like smoke dirt dust gases and clouds the minimum window area for buildings located in a hot humid climate is 1/7 of the floor area and for dry climates 
वन टेंथ ऑफ द फ्लोर एरिया इन द टेबल रेकमेंडेड वैल्यूज ऑफ इल्यूमिनेशन फॉर किचन एंड बाथरूम्स आर मैंशनड दीज वैल्यूज आर वैलिड अंडर मोस्ट ऑफ द कंडीशन वेदर द इल्यूमिनेशन इज बाय नेचुरल लाइटिंग आर्टिफिशियल लाइटिंग और अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ बोथ The illumination values are taken from the National Building Code of India part 8 Illumination is the density of luminous flux incident upon a surface the unit of illumination is lumen per square meter which is known as lux luminous flux is the light given out by a source or received by a surface or transmitted by a medium irrespective of the manner in which it is distributed spatially the unit of luminous flux is lumen good daylighting means not too much light but sufficient light free from glare it should come from the right direction good daylighting is essential to promote the activities carried out within the building particularly to promote the safety of people using the building and to create a pleasant environment this requirement is met by admitting daylight through windows on the basis of daylight factors the efficiency of a window as far as lighting is concerned is judged by means of the percentage of external sunshine that is admitted into the rooms the light may be distributed in three ways directly indirectly or semi directly direct lighting brings the light direct from the source to the surface to be illuminated it is more economical indirect lighting brings the light by reflection or redirection to the surface to be illuminated the light source itself is hidden from view by some reflecting device semi direct lighting is a combination of both direct and indirect lighting I hope you understood the points explained in this video. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. Continuing with the principles of planning. In the last two videos, we have completed several principles of planning. In this video, we will learn about ventilation, circulation, elegance, economy and practical consideration the first principle is ventilation ventilation may be defined as the system of supplying or removing air by natural or mechanical means to or from any enclosed space to create and maintain comfortable conditions orientation of the building and location of windows help in providing proper ventilation window areas are specified according to the rules placement of windows and ventilators should be in such a manner that it facilitates the flow of fresh air into the house a sensation of comfort reduction in humidity removal of heat and proper supply of oxygen are the basic requirements in ventilation apart from reduction of dust there are two methods of ventilation the first one is natural ventilation and the second one is artificial or mechanical ventilation natural ventilation is suitable for houses and flats 
It is achieved by designing windows and ventilators opposite to each other. Window openings should not be less than one fourth the superficial area of that side of the room, which faces an open space. Natural ventilation is due to the air movement induced by wind and or temperature differences. Artificial ventilation is necessary if the room is to be occupied by more than 50 persons or where the space per occupant is less than 3 meter cube. It is achieved in three different ways. Exhaust or extract system, supply system and balance system. The next principle is circulation. Circulation in a building is of two types, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal circulation is between the rooms of the same floor. It should be achieved by provision of passages, corridors, halls and lobbies. Vertical circulation is between different floors and can be achieved by the judicious provision of staircases. Minimum area with sufficient light and ventilation is the basic requirement of both types of circulation units. They should add to the convenience, comfort and privacy of the users. Staircase planning requires consideration in the selection of rise, tread, width of stairs and landing and design of the handrail. The next principle is elegance. Certain compromises have to be made while preparing a particular plan. Site conditions and marginal distances restrict ideas to some extent. Elegance is related to the effect produced by elevation which depends upon the proportion of width, height, doors and windows and the choice of materials. The visualization of elevation should always be kept in mind while preparing a plan. Utility is the main consideration, keeping in mind the cost and architectural design and composition should be studied in detail for achieving success in creating an elegant structure. The next principle is economy. Economy inhibits the freedom of an architect in planning. At the very outset, he should discuss with the client the aspect of current costs. A false idea of economy should not be given. Scope should be kept for future expansion. Economy can be achieved by providing rooms of minimum necessary dimensions, minimum door and window areas. Simple design for windows, plain tiles and fixtures and fastenings of a simple type for internal doors and so on. Besides all the principles of planning discussed, the following practical points should be additionally considered. The strength, stability, convenience and comfort of the occupants of the building should be considered first. Provisions for future extensions without dismantling should be made in the planning. The building should be strong and capable to withstand the likely adverse effects of natural agencies such as earthquake, flood, storm, etc. I hope you understood the points explained in this video. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome back everyone. In this video, we will be learning about building rules and bylaws. So let us first see what are bylaws. Building bylaws are a set of rules under which construction of a building needs to take place. The rules regulate 
coverage, height, architectural design, and safety measures in order to protect buildings against natural disasters such as earthquakes and hazards such as fire as well as structural failures. Development of land and construction of buildings is done according to the development control rules of the municipality corporation, town planning authority or planning sanctioning authority of the area. Architects, contractors, civil engineers, draftsmen and builders are supposed to keep a copy of these bylaws with them for reference. Why are bylaws required? Building bylaws ensure that constructions are not only safe but also adhere to aesthetic standards. In that sense, these regulate the construction and the architectural aspects of construction activities. For example, the rules prescribed under the building bylaws can make it mandatory for builders to keep fire safety and earthquake resistance provisions at their projects. Building bylaws also govern the provisions for open spaces in a project with the aim to ensure that developments do not turn the city into a concrete jungle. Building bylaws also contain rules to ensure that there is minimum harm to the environment as a result of developments. As construction activities involve a lot of aspects that might be harmful or disturbing for those living in the surrounding areas, checks are also put in place to keep such disturbances to their lowest level. Harmful levels of dust accumulation, health hazards, structural failure, risk of fire and high level of noise are some of the aspects that builders need to take care of throughout the construction cycle. Here are the objectives underlying the building bylaws. The main objective is pre-planning of building construction activity, encouraging disciplined and systematic growth of building and towns, encouraging an orderly growth of the area and preventing haphazard development. These laws provide health and comfort to the people residing in the building. These laws also provide each building with proper approaches towards light, air and ventilation. It provides proper and efficient utilization of area of property to achieve maximum efficiency in construction. The principles underlying the building bylaws include classifying the building with unit as a family and mentioning the requirement. Classifying rooms according to use and then specifying minimum standard of each room with respect to size, height, floor area, ventilation and light. Specifying height of compound wall and location of gate. Controlling projection in marginal spaces. Insisting on suitable floor space index or floor area ratio. Specifying suitable arrangements with respect to drainage and water supply. Specifying setbacks, light plan and margins. And lastly, specifying the minimum size of plots. I hope you understood the points explained in this video. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this video, we will be learning about calculation of plinth, floor and carpet area. Let us start with plinth area. This is built up covered area measured at the floor level of the basement or of any story. The following shall be included in the plinth area. The first one is area of walls at the floor level excluding plinth offsets if any when the building consists of column projections beyond cladding. 
The second is internal shafts of sanitary installations provided. These do not exceed 2 meters square in area. Air conditioning ducts, lifts, etc. Porches and other cantilevers provided. The following shall not be included in the plinth area. The first one is area of lofts. Internal sanitary shafts provided these are more than 2 meters square in area. Unclosed balconies. Unless they form a story at the terrace level. Towers, turrets, domes projecting above the terrace level at terrace. And the last one is vertical sunbreakers. Floor area is the usable covered area of the building at any floor level. To get floor area, the area of walls shall be deducted from the plinth area to arrive at the floor area. The following shall be included in the wall area. Doors and other openings in the wall, internal pillars and supports, Plaster along walls exceeding 300 cm square in area. Flues which are within the walls. A flue is a duct, pipe or opening conveying exhaust gases. The following shall be excluded from the wall area. Plaster along walls each not exceeding 300 cm square in areas, fireplace projecting beyond the face of the wall in living or bedrooms, platforms projecting beyond the wall of kitchen. Carpet area is the floor area of the usable rooms at any floor level. The carpet area of any floor shall exclude the following portions of the building. The first one is sanitary accommodations, verandas, corridors and passages, kitchens and, kitchen and pantries, entrance hall and porches, staircases and lastly air conditioning ducts. As you can see in this plan, The red shaded area represents the wall area. The yellow area represents the carpet area. And this green area is the common area. I hope you understood the points explained in this video. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this video, we will be learning about floor area ratio or floor space index. Floor area ratio or floor space index denote the maximum floor space that can be constructed on a piece of land. It is a ratio between a building's total constructed floor area and the land area. Floor area ratio is a concept to regulate population density and to control overcrowding in dwelling units. It limits the total floor area of a building in relation to the plot area. The floor area ratio does not include the basement area, staircase hall, balcony, water tanks on the roofs or terrace, garage, mezzanine floor are also excluded from the total area. For example, if the size of the plot or land being used for the project is 500 square feet and the FAR determined for that particular city or locality is 1.5, then the total floor area that can be constructed will be 500 into 1.5, that is 750 square feet. As the maximum space available on the ground floor will be around 500 square feet, hence with the remaining built up area of 250 square feet, it is possible to construct 
just one more floor. Therefore, considering the plot area and the FAR applicable in that particular locality, a developer would be permitted to construct a one-story building. FSI meaning floor space index, also known as floor area ratio, is the ratio of total built-up area to the total area of the plot. FAR and FSI are used synonymously, the only difference being that while the former is expressed as a ratio, the FSI is an index and is expressed in percentage. The Municipal Council of a particular area is responsible for establishing the FSI limit in a certain range in order to regulate the amount of construction and the size of buildings in that area. Since FSI is a measure that combines the height and footprint of a building, regulating it ensures flexibility in the design of the building. In this table, you can see the values of permissible FSI given with respect to the road width. These values have been taken from UDCPR for Maharashtra State. UDCPR stands for Unified Development Control and Promotion Regulation. This is the code book used in Maharashtra State. For any other state, you need to use its current code book. I hope you understood the points explained in the video. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this video, we will be learning about setback distance. Setback distance can be explained as the minimum open space required around any building or structure. Municipal regulations provide that a specific distance should be maintained between a building and the boundary of the plot on which the building is being constructed. This distance is necessary to ensure that the structure stays away from roads, water bodies or other buildings. Setbacks are required at the front, rear and sides of the buildings and the specifications vary from one area to the other. Here are some reasons as to why setback distance is important. To ensure all buildings receive adequate natural light, to ensure sufficient ventilation, to protect entities such as water bodies located close to a building from being adversely affected by the construction and human inhabitation, to protect one building from the shadow of another, which would otherwise obstruct adequate provision of ventilations and sunlight, to protect buildings from noise-causing elements such as nearby industries, airports or highways, to ensure easy access to the buildings. In short, the purpose of setbacks is to ensure one building does not infringe on the other building's right to sunlight, ventilation, greenery and vehicular access. In this table, the front marginal setback distances are given and they are taken from UDCPR for Maharashtra State. For streets less than 4.5 meter width, here you can see 2.25 from the center of the street is given for residential building and 2.25 plus 1.5 from the center of the street is given for residential buildings with mixed use. Let's see height of the building. In this table, you can see for various regions in Maharashtra, the height of the building is given. The building height up to 24 meter shall be allowed on roads less than 12 meter and for building having height more than 24 meter, the minimum road width shall be 12 meter. I hope you understood the points explained in this video. Thank you for watching.